Good evening, distinguished dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. Welcome to the CIC. CIC is the Chennai International Center. And for those who do not know about us, I'll just give you a small brief introduction. Well, the CIC is a not-for-profit organization. It is formed to promote exchange of information and ideas in the fields of education, business, finance, economics, arts, commerce, literature, law, science and technology, etc. It was founded in 2016 and it was conceived by some of the cities, accomplished industrialists and professionals with an objective of creating an intellectual hub for the city's intelligentsia to meet, to share, to discuss and to e evolve transformational ideas. In short, CIC aspires to be a spa for the mind and the soul. So far, we have conducted more than 160 events since we were formed, and we regularly invite accomplished Indian and global personalities to share their experiences and vision in their respective areas of expertise. We have a strong membership of followers who are professionals, entrepreneurs, academicians, environmentalists, administrators, media persons, and historians who are dedicated towards contributing to shaping the economic, social, and political gradient of our country. We are now poised to expand. We have acquired some land in the heart of Chennai, and we plan to build an iconic campus in that uh, land. In an attempt to reach out to younger audiences, we have started now conducting our events at colleges. We had conducted the last event at the uh, MOP Vaishnav College, and now here we are with you. Next event, we hope to do it in the IIT Madras. So we want to reach out to the younger audiences and I'm sure you are going to enjoy an extremely insightful talk by our chief guest today, Mr. Ananta Nageshwaran. I request all of you to welcome him with a round of applause. Now to introduce, thank you. To introduce our speaker, I invite Mr. Venu, our trustee, to introduce today's chief guest, Sri V. Ananta Nageshwaran, the chief economic advisor from the government of India. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to welcome on behalf of the board of the Chennai International Center, the chief guest today, Dr. V. Ananta Nageswaran, the chief economic advisor to the government of India, a post he's held since January 2022. Dr. Ananta Nageswaran is a writer, author, teacher, consultant, and now a professional speaker. I had the privilege when I was uh, an editor at the uh, Business Line newspaper to host a column by Dr. Ananta Nageshwaran starting 1998. I did some homework digging into our newspaper files and I found the first article he wrote for the newspaper in 1998, where he actually called for the disinvestment of Air India. That was 25 years ago. And, um, and he must be darn happy that uh, event has materialized now, and that too at a time when he joined the government. I believe he joined the government on January 28th and the disinvestment was done, announced on January 27th. Um, in addition to writing newspaper columns, he has authored four books. But I'd like to say how brilliant his career has been so far, starting with his uh, uh, 
being a postgraduate uh, diploma holder in management from IIM Ahmedabad and uh, getting a doctoral degree from the University of Massachusetts in 1994 for his work on exchange rate behavior. In a corporate career spanning 17 years from 1994 to 2011, he was a currency economist at the Union Bank of Switzerland, head of research and investment consulting in Credit Suisse, private banking, head of Asia Research and Global Chief Investment Officer at Julius Baer. And it was in that time he was writing for Business Line. Uh, he's then taught at several business schools and institutes of management in India and in Singapore. He was the Dean of IFMR Graduate School of Business and a distinguished visiting professor of economics at CREA. Before he was appointed chief economic advisor, he was a part-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India from 2019 to 2021. It's my great pleasure now to welcome Dr. Anand Nageshwar. Good evening, everybody. It is very nice of Chennai International Center to start organizing these events uh, in educational institutions because it's always uh, uh, both a challenge and uh, it's refreshing and keeps us on toes when we address students. So I'm very happy that I'm able to address young audience, as well as other distinguished members of the Chennai city as part of this lecture. It was very nice of uh, Venu to pull up that uh, first article I wrote for Business Line in November 1998. And sometimes one, when one looks back and reads what one wrote when I was, when somebody, when I was young, Sometimes you might feel a bit embarrassed. Sometimes you might feel, oh, that's not so bad. So it was one of those articles which made me feel, okay, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> because obviously as you grow, you also pick up much more nuances of how policy is made. But it is equally important that people who are completely outside do not understand how policy is made, but still try to write about these things from a completely independent perspective, that's, that kind of voices are also still required. Because the more you know, sometimes you feel the less you know as well. So it is important for young voices such as yourselves also to continue to sort of articulate the perspectives of ordinary people, even if you are not fully aware of the dynamics and the implications of how policy is made. And that was my takeaway from reading my own article, which was written about almost 25 years ago. The topic uh, Chennai International Center asked me to speak on is this. Have global headwinds delayed India's march towards the US dollar 5 trillion economy? I think we should remember that some of these numbers are merely placeholders. And you will know why when I say that. So it is always going to be the case that global factors will influence outcomes in not only our country, but also elsewhere in the world. And it is a given. But the question is, have we got enough safeguards, enough strengths to be able to deal with those headwinds and still achieve our goals of prosperity and better standards of living for ordinary Indians. It is not about five trillion or six or seven. It is ultimately about what kind of standards of living that we can give to ordinary Indians. Okay, I'm gonna be speaking to you on these four different heads. First, I'll quickly share with you how the world economic outlook itself 
appears at this point. And then about India's macroeconomic fundamentals, then why growth in India this decade will be better than last decade? And what are the challenges and tasks ahead if we have to improve further? All right. Uh, I think some lights, I don't know whether these lights are too bright for the audience to see the slides given the, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the, the bars may not be as visible to you um, out there. So you have to take my word for it. Okay. Um, what we are showing here in these charts is the inflation rates of several countries in the developed world in 2022. Most of them have a target of achieving inflation of only 2% every year, but this chart tells you that most of them had inflation numbers in high single digits on average. And in some emerging market and developing economies, such as ourselves, also experienced slightly higher inflation. Although I must tell you, in India, the average inflation rate that we achieved in the calendar year 2022 was no different from our long-term 60-year average of around 7%. So India actually has a target of around 4% with a range of 2 to 6, but we ended up achieving something close to 7 in the calendar year. Whereas many developed countries have a target of 2%, but their average inflation rate was as high as 8 or 9% in the course of 2022. So after a long spell of 40 years of low inflation or declining inflation, suddenly the genie of inflation was out of the bottle in many countries around the world, advanced or emerging. Of course, this is not the forum to be uh, going into the details of what caused it. Many people would say the inflation rate picked up around the world because of, anybody out there have a guess? Students of economics, not the audience in the front row here, please. I said no, nobody in the first three rows, please. Over there? Okay, so many of you would say the reason was that Russia invasion of Ukraine was the cause of the rise in inflation rates around the world. But the truth is, in economics, you have to distinguish between proximate causes and long-term causes. The Russian invasion of Ukraine might have been a proximate cause. But the other real reason behind it is that many developed countries had put in place enormous amount of monetary and fiscal stimulus, not only in response to the 2020 pandemic, but even before, in 2008, after the global financial crisis. They had not fully withdrawn that stimulus, and then the 2020 pandemic happened, and they came up with even further stimulus in terms of putting money into the hands of people and mon monetary policy slashed interest rates and flooded the economy with liquidity. So those combined with the supply disruptions, with the increase in oil price, food, fertilizer, etc., caused by the war, all of them came together to form a combustible inflation mix in 2022. And that genie having gotten out of the bottle is not going to go back into the bottle anytime soon. And that is one of the first headwinds for the $5 trillion that we are speaking about. In the next slide, what you are seeing here is that on the left, I hope you can see them as well as I can see, the, see it here. The left slide chart shows you what is called the Global Policy Uncertainty Index. In general, while it might be going up and down, the trend is on the up, which means it is an index composed to, as, a com as a combination of various news articles, various research papers, talking about the levels of uncertainty in the world. So when the line is sloping upwards, as you can see here, when the line is sloping upwards, 
the level of uncertainty in the world is becoming elevated. The former US Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, spoke about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. So what is happening in the world is, not only there are known unknowns, there are quite a lot of unknown unknown. That is the difference between risk and uncertainty. Risk means you know the range of outcomes and you know the associated probabilities. Uncertainty means you don't even know what are the various possible outcomes, let alone being able to assign a probability to it. That is the kind of world we are living in and that is what we need to get used to. And that could be called the second headwind for India's ambitions as well. On the, on the right side, what you see is the increase in interest rates that central banks around the world have done in the course of 2022 and continuing to do so in 2023 as well. So the, the orange color bars talk about emerging economies and the blue color bars talk about the advanced economies. Interest rates are going up everywhere. Cost of borrowing is going to rise, but the flip side is depositors are finally getting what they always felt they have been cheated off, okay? So today, a bank deposit in the US dollar will get them 5% interest rate. A bank deposit in a currency like Singapore dollar will get you 35 to 4% interest rate. Even in India, because RBI increased interest rates by 250 basis points or 2.5% last year, you are getting more returns on your fixed deposits as well. The only country which has a negative change in the interest rates, since many of you cannot see what that uh, country's name is from a distance, can you guess? Again, those of you who can read from the front, please don't say so. I'm asking the students because they should be able to guess this answer even if they can't read what is out there. China is a country which has, China is a country which has seen a slight decline in the interest rate, and that tells you Chinese economy is actually going through a different cycle right now. They are more dealing with an economic downturn, and that is one of the reasons why they reopened very quickly after, after swearing by a very strong zero COVID policy. So the speed of the reopening in China this year, the speed of economic recovery in China this year, and the implications it will have for commodity prices could be the third headwind for not only India, but several emerging economies. The next slide shows you basically global manufacturing sector's performance is beginning to come down because of interest rates going up everywhere. And the WTO and UNCTAD are saying that the global trade volumes will actually become somewhat slower, will grow slowly in the course of 2023 as a result of interest rates going up and economic growth slowing down. So when world trade goes down, we may think that India's exports will go down. That is true. But what is the net outcome for India? when global economy becomes cooler. When the world economy becomes somewhat cooler, the growth rate slows down. Is it on balance good for India or bad for India? If the world economic growth is going to slow down on balance, on a net basis, is it good for India or bad for India? Bad. You're all sure? But what is the answer you as students of economics should have said? The first thing you are taught in economics is to say, huh? very good. So the first, for, any, for any question your teacher asks you, the best answer you can give is it depends, right? So then the problem is the teacher has to ask you, it depends on what? So, the net effect of global 
slow down this year as somebody who wrote the economic survey and that is why you should read it in chapter 2 or cha or the preface which of is about four pages we say that global slowdown for india will be on balance on a net basis will be positive why yes there will be a negative impact india's exports may slow down but when world economy slows down interest rate increases will stop in the developed world the appreciation of the us dollar will end may even reverse and investors in developed countries will start looking for returns and earnings in the developing world and capital flow will begin to come to our economies the price of crude oil and commodities will slow down will even decline therefore against these four or five positives there could be a slight impact on india's export growth which on balance therefore a global slowdown will actually be somewhat more beneficial for us in fact couple of weeks ago i had a very large it software export exporter came to my office and he said indian it enabled services exports actually are global recession proof he said when the global economy is booming i get orders from the front office of american and european companies when their economy is slowing down i get orders from their back office so both ways i win and when i went and checked the data after he left he was right the correlation between global growth and indian software export growth was barely 5% which is a good news so a global slowdown need not necessarily affect our services exports and i will show that chart to you and if you look at the currency performance that is what i told you when interest rates are going up in the united states our countries face weaker currencies because interest higher interest rates make it attractive to hold dollars make it attractive for people to send money to euro to send money to the us to british pound because you get interest rates there right and when our currencies become weaker is it good for us or bad for us bad why somebody said good so let us first ask the person who said bad why is bad somebody who said good why is it good okay that's a good answer uh, but a partial answer what should you say what is the second thing you learn in economics besides saying it depends what's the second thing you learn for every statement before you start to make in response to a question in your exam paper or in the class what is the most important thing that in economics you have to prefix before every sentence yeah ceteris paribus or everything else being equal everything else held constant you might say a weaker currency and if i if you want to be very precise in the short run may help export growth you have to be very clear so a weaker currency may help exports but a weaker currency may also discourage foreigners from sending money to your country because if your currency is going to become cheaper every day they may decide to wait until it has reached its low point and secondly your imports may become costlier especially your imports are unavoidable essential imports like crude oil you may end up paying much more with a weaker currency the landed cost of crude oil for you will become expensive so what is the answer therefore it depends on it depends and depends on the elasticity of imports and exports to exchange rate many things in macroeconomics is about empirical reality not on the basis of theory so whether a weaker currency helps or hurts depends on 
the elasticities of India's imports and exports to the exchange rate. On that basis, it is very difficult to say India always benefits from a weaker currency. Okay? India doesn't. Again, this slide looks like it is difficult for you to see. All you can see is a line that has been coming down. The United States economy, according to this slide, is heading into a potential recession zone in 2023, which, if it happens, will be good from the, for the reasons I mentioned to you earlier. Dollar will become weaker, the Fed will stop hiking interest rates, and there will be less pressure on the Indian central bank to raise interest rates as well. So now, this is what I've given you, the global context and the headwinds that the global economy is going to pose for us in 2023. But we do have some innate strengths, which is going to keep us growing at a very decent rate compared to many other economies in the world. First thing, our economic recovery from the pandemic is complete, which is what the title of chapter one of the economic survey is. Recovery complete. And if you look at the share of private consumption of GDP, it has gone from 56.4% to 59.9% over the last four, uh, six months of first half of 2019, 2021, 22, 23. So between April and September, in the current financial year, the share of private consumption to GDP is 59.9%. It was barely 56.4% before the pandemic. So as the GDP rises, private consumption has grown even faster, which is a good thing. And you might have read in the newspapers that India has a K-shaped recovery. Many newspapers or many journalists use the alphabet K because but I have a problem with the characterization of the Indian recovery as a K-shaped recovery because K means one line is sloping upwards and one line is sloping downwards. That is not the case. One line may be sloping upwards very steeply, which is the urban economy, the formal economy. The other line may be growing a little less slowly, maybe flatter. So you require a slanted V rather than K to depict India's recovery. It's a slanted V. One line growing faster, one growing, growing as well, but growing a bit slowly. It is usually the case that when the first signs of recovery happen, it is the formal economy that benefits, and then it starts percolating or diffusing down as construction sector picks up, as uh, uh, private consumption picks up, investments begin to happen, then employment recovery happens. So it is a process and the process is underway. The next slide. This is what I showed you about India's export growth. If you look at data on services exports and manufacturing or merchandise goods exports, India's services exports you have to take my word for it because you may not be able to read the actual numbers. For the first 10 months of the current financial year, we have hit $264 billion. And in terms of goods, we have hit $369 billion compared to 340 last year and compared to 220 or so in 21-22. So 22-23, in spite of a global economy which is getting hurt by higher interest rates. India's services exports have grown and merchandise exports also have grown slightly. Now, when the full year is over, by the end of March 31, our combined exports of goods and services will be close to three quarters of a trillion dollar, $750 billion. And India's exports and imports as a share of GDP will be coming back towards almost equivalent of 40% of GDP. Okay, an economy which is going to be around $3.5 trillion by the end of this financial year will have a GDP, will have a combined value of, this is only export, I'm talking about exports and imports put together, we will have a combined openness of around 45% of GDP. So India is often considered a closed economy, but our exposure to the world, both in terms of exports and imports, is almost 45%, which is, 
which means we have to be very sensitive to what is happening in the rest of the world. Next slide. Okay. And what you are seeing here is that um, India actually is part of the global economy where manufacturing is still continuing to expand. These countries have manufacturing expansion and these countries where manufacturing sector is contracting, India is on the top here. And if you look at the services sector as well, India's services sector is in an expansion zone. This orange line at 50 is basically a neutral zone and above 50, means the services sector is expanding and growing. Okay. And this is where bulk of our hopes are lying. The government of India has been spending a lot of money on public investments, infrastructure. What you are seeing here is that in this budget announced on February 1, 2022, what is the total capital expenditure allocation that the finance minister announced. Does anybody know? What is the capital expenditure? Uh, first four rows, no. Students, how many of you have read the budget speech? Huh? 10 trillion. Yeah. What is the number you said? 10 lakh crores. That's right. That's the correct number. From 7.5 lakh crores to 10 lakh crores is the public investment announced in the budget. Which means not only what the government of India spends directly, but also what government of India gives as loans to states to spend on capital expenditure put together. It will be 10 lakh crores in 22-23. And what I'm showing in this is that the question that many people have is when will the private sector also start investing? And what we are showing based on data from 3,000 companies is that the private sector has already started increasing its investments year after year. But in April, September 22, 23, the private sector has already invested close to 3.3 lakh crores based on data given by 3,000 plus companies to the regulator SEBI based on their cash flow data. And it has been increasing from 2.1 to 2.4 to 3.3. 10 sectors, 10 out of 10 sectors, the, the expenditure in 22-23 is far better than the expenditure in 21-22. So, the much awaited capital expenditure cycle of the Indian private sector is still not, is not dormant, but is already showing signs of life. And that's very important for us. And the government's emphasis on capital expenditure has been rising from around 4.5 lakh crores to about 13.5 lakh crores in 23-24. That is an increase of three times in the last six to seven years. And if you look at the government's share of capital expenditure in its budget has gone up from 12% to 22%, which means the quality of government expenditure has improved. More than spending money on revenue items, 88% of the budget used to go for revenue items, now it's about 78% only. So the quality of government expenditure has improved in the last five to six years. And it is not just uh, improvement in the expenditure quality of the union government, we also show as per RBI data, the quality index of public expenditure of states also has been rising. And I encourage students to go and download this report, the state of the state's finances, which RBI brought out in January. It is a treasure trove of information. I think most of you, not only should read what is given to you as part of your syllabus, but you should also take time out to explore the websites of the Reserve Bank of India, to explore the website of Department of Economic Affairs, and many other international 
<clears throat> central bank websites to understand what is going on in the outside world and connect what you are being taught in the classroom with what is happening outside as well. And as you can see here on the left hand side, corporate tax collections have been rising, personal income tax collections have been rising and the average GST was around 1.2 lakh crores per month last year and in 22-23 the average GST collection is about 1.5 lakh crores every month and these kind of revenue improvement whether it is direct taxes or indirect taxes is what has enabled the government to spend on better roads, better railways and better infrastructure in general. Now. This is a big if. Inflation in India, as per the forecast made by RBI and as per the uh, uh, IM Ahmedabad Inflation Expectation Survey among businesses, our inflation rate is expected to come down in 23-24. But a lot depends on something very important. Whether inflation comes down or not depends on one major factor. What is it? Sorry? Very good. And wh what does it affect? What does it affect? The monsoon? Monsoon will affect food output, food prices, as well as economic growth. Okay? So we are going to face the possibility of an El Nino condition in, 20, in the calendar year 2023. Which means, some of us may be noticing already in North India, the temperatures even in the month of March have started rising. And February was one of the warmest in 60 years in Delhi, for example. And therefore, this is a major headwind, whether inflation comes down and whether it affects food production, agricultural production, and therefore overall economic growth is an important risk factor we need to watch out. Next slide. However, while we are all concerned about the near-term situation, about the global uncertainties, about the, uh, uh, about the possibility of a bad or a good monsoon this year, etc., but we need to abstract from the short-term considerations and look at where we are heading in the medium term. And the reason why the medium term looks good is because last decade, between 2011 and 2020, we went through a period of adjustment in our economy, which is going to serve us well in the coming decade. By and large, the government's economic reform has followed this paradigm, energy transition. We have a target of reaching 500 gigawatts of non fossil fuel, coal, petrol and diesel, non-fossil fuel energy will be 500 gigawatts and will constitute at least 50% of our energy requirement by 2030. Private sector participation, production linked incentive schemes, asset monetization and privatization in general will, incre will increase private sector participation in the economy and improve ease of doing business as well and public goods for inclusive growth, digitization, UPI, Aadhaar, DigiLocker, FastTag will all come under this. Trust-based governance, for example, faceless income tax assessment, self-assessment for many different requirements of the government, uh, EKYC, all these things will enhance trust-based governance. Together, all four of them improving ease of doing business and ease of living and all of this in combination should ensure efficient resource allocation in the economy leading to higher productive potential and better growth and better standards of living. This is the economic model that the government has been following for the last eight years or so. If you look at the simplification of regulatory frameworks, it has resulted in basically improved investor sentiment coming from insolvency and bankruptcy code. Now, the insolvency and bankruptcy code, you may say that the recovery that uh, failed firms' assets give to the banks is around 30%. For every one rupee that the banks have lent, they are recovering 30 paise, and you might think that it is actually rather disappointing. 
But the truth is, what is more important is the culture of debt repayment that it has brought in. Many cases are not even brought to the insolvency and bankruptcy code and settled by the debtors even before it gets there because they know that once it gets into this process, their assets may not necessarily stay with them but go to the most competitive bidder. So the cultural improvement it has brought about, and you can see that in the website of Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board, the data tell us that there is a very big change in the debt culture of the Indian borrowers as well. And the ease of doing business, whether it is Real Estate Development Act, whether it is in uh, many forms of decriminalization, all of this are leading to ease of doing business. We only give illustrative examples here. Effective governance, amendments to Companies Act, and the Jan Vishwas bills, etc. Mostly it is about a work in progress towards making government responsive to citizens. Now, and if you look at the infrastructure, whether it is roads, power capacity, generating capacity, where we were in 2014 and where we are in 2020 is the green dot, we have come a long way. You might say railway tracks, we have not improved much. But that is because bulk of the railway networks was laid well before 2012-13, but even there, while it took about 60 years to add about 50,000 kilometers, in the last eight years, we have added about close to 8,000 kilometers of new railway track as well. So whether it is roads, whether it is power systems, etc., the progress we have made in installed capacities and infrastructure shows up here. While this is a concrete achievement, we also have to take a look at the ecosystem, the software ecosystem, public-private partnership, national infrastructure pipeline, national asset monetization, PM Gati Shakti, and the national logistics policy. National logistics policy makes it easier for companies to reduce their last mile cost. India, for example, has 13% cost added to its exports because of inefficient logistics. The global average is 6%. Our goal is to bring it down to 8% in the next five years. PM Gati Shakti is about making government companies implement projects efficiently with minimal cost and time overruns. National monetization and national infrastructure pipeline together means government assets which are not productive should be made more productive either by leasing them or selling them to private players. And if you look at the digital public infrastructure network, which is what we talk about, all of us know today that even a two rupee transaction can be paid by using your bar QR code, right? And there is a story that my finance minister is very fond of narrating. Even the, the gentleman who comes during Pongal days to collect your inams, from every household has got a QR code on the forehead of the bull. And he basically, instead of collecting cash from you, he basically asks you to use your phone to basically scan the QR code, which is on the forehead of the bull. And that is how he collected his uh, Pongal uh, payments. This was a true story, which he is very fond of narrating in different forums. And that tells us the diffusion of the UPI. And what data are telling us is that, UPI, Aadhaar, uh, Fastag Highway System, and then Digi Locker, and then now the new, uh, new innovations called the account aggregators, the credit enable network, open network, digital commerce, all these initiatives are creating opportunities even for the smallest of businesses to become part of the global market space. So in fact, recently a World Bank put out a report saying that informal enterprises, when they become part of the e-commerce network, their growth prospects become as bright as formal and large enterprises. So therefore, this entire digital improvement of India is likely to be adding 30 to 50 basis points of growth every year because digitization means better formalization, and better financial inclusion.
what happened in India in the last 20 years, since the turn of the millennium is that, India went through a high credit cycle. Companies borrowed very furiously in the first decade. Their debt to GDP ratio rose very steeply, and then it came down in the second decade, which means companies over borrowed, went into a debt problem, had to reduce their debt. This is the non-financial private sector. This is the non-financial corporate sector. Debt to GDP ratio goes up and comes down. So it, it went up from 2000 to 2010, came down from 2011 to 20. Now it will once again pick up because our, our economy went through over borrowing and then went through a period of indigestion between 2011 and 20. Now we are ready for the next phase of expansion. You look at this year. This is 2000 to 2010. Excessive borrowing of credit. Growth of credit well above trend. This is the trend line. And therefore we had to basically improve the bank balance sheets, corporate balance sheets. All of this happened between 2011 and 2020, more particularly between 2014 and 2020, after the asset quality review of the Bank of India, et cetera. So basically, we went through a period of low credit growth, low investment, because we had a classic financial cycle, boom and bust. So now we are ready to expand, and that, together with the digitization, give us room for optimism about India's growth prospects in the third decade. If we are today where we were in 2012, we should be concerned. Because by 2012, Indian companies had over-borrowed, banks had over-lent, and there was no room to further expand balance sheets. But where we are today is, Corporate balance sheets are lean and mean and trim. Bank balance sheets are well capitalized. So therefore, India's growth cycle will benefit from the investment cycle, which will begin to happen or is already beginning to happen because you can see in the subsequent slides, credit growth is picking up. Non-food credit growth was 6% in the last two years, went up to 13% in 2022, and more importantly, credit to micro, small, and medium enterprises is now running at 30%. And promoting the private sector as a partner in development, I had already mentioned them, so I won't belabor the point here. I can take questions on this later. And energy transition is something that India is uh, very committed to. However, most of you should now begin to understand that climate transition is going to be a big challenge for countries like India. Why? Because to transfer our dependence on petrol and diesel to sun, wind, and uh, uh, renewable energy in general, you need critical minerals and rare earth minerals. These are only available in three, four countries at the moment. We recently discovered a lot of lithium deposits in Jammu and Kashmir. But in general, the minerals you require for renewable energy are only found in three, four countries. And they are processed heavily in only one country. Which country is that? China. So availability is in three, four countries. Processing happens in one country, and the balance 185 countries are more of consumers. So how oil was a geopolitical weapon in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, rare earths and critical minerals may become geopolitical weapons in the coming years. So that is going to be a major challenge we need to keep in mind when we talk about India becoming a prosperous country. So challenges on the way forward. So global growth is forecast to slow this year. We have gone through all of this. And because of the slower growth, there will be some implications, but more importantly, more than slower growth, which I welcome in the developed world. The problem is right now they have high inflation, interest rates are going to go up, and that is a bigger challenge for us. And if the, if the war in Ukraine continues and if China's recovery from the COVID is as fast as it appears now, we need to keep a watch on the oil price as well.
And therefore, the concern we have at the moment is borrowing cost or interest rates in developed country may stay longer and higher, okay? Uh, but in spite of all of this, since the topic given to me was, will India become a $5 trillion economy? Or rather the headwinds. The number at the end of March 2023, according to the IMF, India will be about three and a half trillion dollar economy. But I think based on the current exchange rate, it will be more likely 3.4 rather than 3.5. But in the financial year, 26, 27, we will be almost near 4.9 trillion dollars. In 27, 28, we will cross the 5 trillion mark. I, but as I told you at the very beginning, numbers are merely placeholders. India in 1993, can anybody guess what was the GDP of India in 1993 in dollar terms? Any guess? Wild guess. 30 years ago. India's GDP in dollar terms. Now the first four rows can also participate because they wouldn't know the answer. Pretty close. Pretty close. It was close to 280, 300 billion dollars in 1993 March. So by the end of March 2023, it is going to be 3.4 trillion, roughly 12 times. During this period, the Indian rupee went from roughly 30 to a dollar to now we are at 82 to a dollar. So in spite of the rupee depreciating, the Indian economy has grown nearly 12 times in dollar terms in the last 30 years. That is a 9% compounded annual growth rate. In spite of almost average of 3% rupee depreciation against the dollar every year. So now, if we achieve 10% growth in dollar terms in the next 7 years, $3.5 trillion will become $7 trillion by 2030. And the responsibility for doing so is in your hands. Okay? So on that basis, on that note, I will basically stop and use this slide whenever there are questions. Thank you very much. We would now invite question and answers. So I request anyone who has a question to put up their hand. The mic will come to you. Please ask questions and not make statements. I think we should take advantage of uh, the Honorable CEA's presence here to get answers rather than making our own statements. Sure. Yes, sir. Sure. Happy evening to you all. Sure. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate to our Honorable Prime Minister and uh, Prime Minister Sitaram, Nirmala Sitaram Ji and uh, Ministry of Finance Affairs. Sure. Sure. So, the, my question is, upcoming election, 2024 election, so if government is comes from that majority, this uh, easily we can achieve for this uh, 5 trillion economy. But if any condition government form, that time is policy. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, the same that uh, government as the form is easily we can achieve for this uh, 5 trillion economy. How can we arrive that 5 trillion economy? I, I don't know. But definitely that more than uh, 10 million, 20 trillion million economy also we can achieve easily because for this policy making. If condition government, if coalition government is forming, that time and all, the policy is complete to be changing. Import and export, energy, these all are policy to be changing. That time and all, how can we achieve for that 5 trillion economy? How can we? How can we achieve this 5 trillion economy? If import export policy to be changing, how can we achieve? There's a no. more, 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 more and uh, participating only for import and export policy only. No, no. Political risk. Sorry? You're asking about the political risk? Yes, yes. The, some, the coalition government form, now the policy to be changing, how can that uh, we can achieve? For the policy risk or political policy risk? Policy for the import and export policy to be changing, no? No, I was, I was showing you in my, char, in my slides there that notwithstanding the kind of governments we have had over the last several years or several decades, um, our exports have continued to rise. So we are currently going to achieve for 22-23 roughly around $750 billion of total exports, both goods and services. Now, in 2003-8 to eight period when the economy was growing very strongly, exports played a very big role. 
But this decade, as I said, there are so many unknown unknowns, right? So export growth is going to be somewhat lower because the world economy is going to grow a bit slowly compared to the first decade of the millennium. That is why my assumption for the growth rate of the Indian economy in dollar terms is only 10% per annum. Otherwise, I would have taken the assumption of 12% per annum GDP growth and we will be able to achieve this 7 trillion number even two years earlier. So my point is exports and foreign trade matter. And we have to continue to do whatever we need to do, such as making our exports competitive. And the answer to that not just lies in the hands of the government. For example, the Indian private sector has one of the lowest shares of research and development spending compared to other countries in the world, whether developed or developing. Government on its part has to create infrastructure, bring down last mile costs, and make sure that the cost of capital is affordable. All those things are in government's hands. But the, but the sense of competitiveness and quality and willingness to take the longer view and spending on R&D has to come from the private sector. But the point, what the good news is, the trend is in the right direction. Thank you. Good evening, sir. My question is, I've been reading reports that the female labor force participation in India is very low. Ah. And that is even in comparison with other countries as well. So why do you think it's so low and what can be done to improve this, sir? Do you, uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, on the female labor force participation rate uh, in, the, in the newspaper called Mint, uh, about a couple of months ago, one of my very young and talented lady colleague, Deeksha, and I wrote a piece on this. So I would like you to do an internet search and locate it and read it, but I'll give you the answer. First of all, female labor force participation rate is not comparable across nations. The methodology isn't uniform. The International Labor Organization prescribes certain methods of collecting data and reporting. And we should not just count only paid work, but even unpaid work, if it contributes to economic activity, should be counted according to the ILO. Unfortunately, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation that collects this data, along with the quarterly periodic labor force survey, does not use the questionnaire in the manner that ILO prescribes. So, Indian female labor force participation rate, unfortunately, is very substantially understated. And if we are following international norms, the Indian female labor force participation rate today will be in the 40s percentage and not in the 20s percentage. That said, there is no denying or there is no uh, uh, minimizing the importance of governments in the country, union and states, having to do whatever they need to do to make it easier for women to make those choices themselves. In terms of keeping the uh, streets safer, in terms of workplace flexibility, in terms of childcare facility, in terms of workplace discrimination, all those things, whatever legislative and other actions governments have to take to make it easier for women to make those choices, the governments should continue to do. But if you want to interpret statistics, you have to understand that we are not doing the right way and we are actually scoring self goals with the way we measure India's female labor force participation rate. The Thank gentleman you. in the blue shirt. Yeah. Uh -huh. Next will be... Sir, uh, uh, I have seen the slide where uh, there's an impetus. Uh, I mean, uh, you have said that uh, the uh, capital formation in the private sector has started to... Pick up. Uh, pick up, yeah. Uh, I, I see a, a lot of uh, need for that in the, uh, you know, going forward. One of the stumbling block in that is that, uh, you know, there's no 
send back, I mean, there's no GST credit on the capital expenditure, more so on the construction activity. You are hit by a roadblock there. And if that can be eased out, even if it can be staggered, I think uh, the cost of construction, CapEx, uh, would count down. That could also be an incentive in, uh, you know. Okay. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. So, why the government failed to cater the need of most distressed sector of this economy, that is agriculture sector, sir. I'm refraining why, from why, why the government failed to cater the need of most distressed sector of this economy, that is agriculture sector, sir. I'm refraining from making any statement, but let me put some data in front of you. Uh, if you talk about doubling farmers' income, it's a dream. It's it's still a dream. If you talk about MSP, there is no correlation between MSP and inflation. So if you talk about if you talk about the current situation of farmers, so it is getting worse. And we are getting a target of five t uh, five trillion economy in next five years. But still, this sector is more distressed sector. And the most sector that is secondary sector, tertiary sector, are directly or indirectly indirectly depend on the agriculture itself. And if, if you look at the country, our country is agrarian country, but still the farmers are the ones who are not pay, who are not well in our country. Why so, sir? I have been a, a, a supporter of Modi nomics, but this things makes me a huge criti critic of the same. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if it was a question or a statement. So, like, like why? It is a question or a statement? Sir, so it's a question is why the government is not able to cater the need of farmers. Why is the government not able to? Able to cater the need of farmers, sir. No, government has a target of doubling farmers' income and MSPs are set at 150% of the cost and uh, there is a PM Kisan Saman that is going on and farmers' credit growth is actually in double digits and if you look at the agricultural sector output growth in the last three years the last several years is in line with the average of five percent three sorry excuse me three percent and if you look at this budget itself there are so many other uh, venture capital and other initiatives natural farming and also uh, uh, different other schemes have been announced in this budget and it is important that farming workers are given opportunities to migrate as the farm sector becomes more productive. We have become a farm exporting country. We were a farm uh, a grains importing country earlier. All those things would not have happened had the farm sector been in distress. So, but the MSP is increase of wheat increase by 4.9%. And if you look at the inflation of crude oil itself, that is diesel, it's up approx 25%. And the inflation is also around 6%. And MSP has been already increased by 5%, sir. No, no, no. You have to check the growth in the MSP. Sir, of the MSP. I'm talking about wheat, sir. Right now, I'm talking about wheat. Wheat. I'm talking about wheat, wheat sir. It yeah. has been only increased by 5%, 4.9%. No, no, no. Farmers actually get MSPs fixed at a rate which is definitely not below the ma market price because if it is below the market price, then they have the option to sell in the marketplace as well. Sir. So the important thing is, as an economy grows from uh, uh, grows in size, it is natural that the primary sector will become relatively less important as a constituent. That doesn't mean that the government becomes indifferent to the interests of the farmers. And farming sector is not just only about grain producers, it's also about poultry, it's all about dairy, it's about edible oil farmers, etc. So you must look at the entire farming sector before you come to the conclusion that you are drawing. I so do have, but I will take take it. It. You can take it offline if you want, because we don't want to hold up other people as well. Good All right, evening, thanks. sir. Good evening, sir. Considering the geopolitical turbulence, uh, what would be the future trajectory towards the process of de-dollarization de of our rupee? De-dollarization? Ah, yes, sir. Is there any scope in the near future, sir? There is, at the moment, there is no alternative to the dollar. And uh, either the... The three criteria for a currency to be internationally accepted. It is a stable store of value, it is an important medium of exchange, and it is a good unit of accounting. So today you have commodities in the world priced in dollars, whether it is crude oil, copper, whether it is wheat or rice, whether it is uh, even pork bellies or orange juice, they are all priced in dollars. Even if trade happens between two countries where the dollar is not the currency, 
you have to pay in dollars. So this is a certain inertia that is therefore built in in the use of dollars. And in 2008 or 9, when the first Bitcoin was introduced, it was expected, or at least the ideal goal of the person who came up with this was that they would pose a competition to central bank currencies. But what you have seen is that they are, if anything, inferior to the central bank currencies in terms of alternatives. So replacement for the dollar doesn't look imminent at this point. Can we have Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah, I speak? Please. Okay. So I wanted to check uh, with the tailwinds. I think India is facing a lot of uh, tailwinds while you mentioned at the macro level uh, headwinds. Tailwinds are the uh, US-China trade war which started off four or five years ago and then the COVID and then you know the Ukraine war and then the Nancy Pelosi visit to Taiwan. And these are all tailwinds for global value chains seeking to move out of China which was initially China plus one and now recently it's become completely 100% exit China and several companies have been able to do that. Why is it that we are not able to attract these companies to come and set up uh, manufacturing and the value chains in India with the potential that we really have in the country, but we are still not able to capitalize on this? No, that's a fair question. But the truth is, um, many of these things, will companies are unwilling to discuss in public what they are doing in terms of relocating the supply chains to India because naturally it will attract the ire and the wrath of uh, other countries and as you might be reading in the papers at least I can tell you Apple and its supply chain are very serious about locating in India and we are also seeing that in couple of other sectors uh, such as toys, painting and specialty glasses etc those have shifted very remarkably and substantively from China towards India uh, and also uh, in Vietnam recently some of the political developments that have happened have also made companies you know rethink uh, their strategy of uh, considering Vietnam as the nearest possible alternative to China so this is a shift that will take place over several years and we should also keep in mind the fact that in the last couple of years the pandemic and the war and the commodity price shock have made companies also reevaluate their investment plans and uh, even advanced countries are beginning to attract reshoring and onshoring. So considering all of that, uh, the pace at which the kind, uh, the inquiries we are getting from companies wanting to relocate to India tells us that this is not something that is going to, uh, that is not happening at the right pace. If anything, I would argue that it is gathering momentum in terms of the kind of conversations we are having with several of them. And I am I'm quite positive that the data would begin to reflect that in the coming few, in the coming years. Because these conversations are very serious and very many companies are, <coughs> excuse me, very clear about doing this. So I, I feel that the prospects for this, uh, for India to be able to plug itself, we have got 14 sectors in the PLI schemes. And at the moment, pharma and electronics are doing quite well. And uh, uh, I fe we feel that uh, telephone sector will also uh, be one of the winning stories. And we have lots of hopes for the renewable energy as well. So even if four to five sectors out of 14 turn out to be good successes in terms of uh, India plugging itself into the global value chain, this entire PLS scheme would have delivered its uh, purpose. So we are quite confident of this uh, achieving its goals. Offline, sir. There, Good evening, sir. So, uh, I have a small doubt. Uh, so, uh, this is regarding the ongoing trade war between US and China, and that too with the uh, conflict right now with the security and defense. Do you think that will have any negative impact on India? India? The ongoing uh, disputes between US and China, will it have a negative impact on India? Is that the question? Yeah, the trade war. Yeah, so I think in general, if any of these global conflicts go out of control, it will have a general damaging effect on investors' risk appetite to relocate or to expand investments. So when, whenever people are afraid or fearful, they will just pull back, okay? 
So and then they will just put everything on hold. So even if you're not directly involved, it will have an impact, collateral damage that will happen. And global growth will slow down. Much of the production will get diverted to other areas like, you know, uh, uh, war related areas. And mind you, this conflict may not necessarily take place only in battlefields. It can happen in other ways as well. So if the conflict intensifies between these two nations, it will naturally have a negative impact and we will not be exempt from its negative impact as well. But there will be positive uh, side effects as well. Ultimately, as I said in the case of uh, uh, global growth, I said on balance, we have to take both into consideration and come to a conclusion. So on balance, I don't know whether the net effect will be only negative for India. It might even be positive. Okay? Yes. Sir, here. Yes, working. Sir, I think the Tamil Nadu contribution to the GST is much more than UP and any other, any other states. But why are we receiving less than UP and any other states? Are you a student of economics? Yes, sir. You speak Tamil? Yes, sir. Uh, some of these people in the front row might know of a Tamil play in the 80s or Rudra Tandava by V.K. Ramaswamy. Which year? 80s maybe? 80. 1980. There is a play called Rudra Tandavam by this Andakalat Nagichuvai Nadigar V.K. Ramaswamy. Our day a play. Adala Vandu in the Pujari Vandu Sivan Oda he will have a Urayadal. Adha and the play and the drama. Adala Vandu the Urundu Vada Sayyar the Pati or a conversation varo. Adala Murunja Thedi Paranga. Then you will understand why you should not be looking at these things in compartments. So, you know, GST is the same as GST. Sir, this is not the right answer, I think. Huh? This might be not the right answer, I think. It is the right answer, which means you cannot just look at uh, these issues purely in monetary terms. There are many other benefits you are getting in non-monetary terms as well. And in many countries around the world, it is always the case that certain states will be contributing monetarily but receiving benefits non-monetarily also by being part of a union or a federation. You cannot be looking at these things purely in dollars and cents or rupees and paise. So you have to take a holistic view of the benefits you are getting because you have a market in some other states when you produce. If you are going to be only saying, I am contributing so much to the uh, GST and I am only getting this much less, there could be many other benefits you are getting by being part of a system. That is why I said, you cannot be purely looked at it in a narrow framework. That is what I said. And it is true in several countries around the world. That is how you contribute to all-round development as well. And if you look at the growth of GST revenues for Tamil Nadu, post-GST, the growth rates are higher than the pre-GST growth rates as well. Front row, please. What, what, in your opinion, is the probability of India slipping into Hindu rate of growth? First of all, I take exception to the use of the word, uh, the Hindu rate of growth. Not mine. I know. Unfortunate. Unfortunate. Uh, the same so-called Hindu India also grew at 8 to 9 percent between 2003 and 2008. I think, in fact, the period when India's growth rate was around 3.5% per annum, referred to as the period of the so-called Hindu rate of growth, actually in the 1950s, we grew at 5% plus, And our growth rate was as good as South Korea's growth rate in the 1950s. It was the 60s and 70s where the growth rate slowed down quite sharply, and partly because of the war with China in 62, and then multiple droughts, and then many other policies as well. But honestly, from the 1980s onwards, we grew at 5.5% average in 1980s, which went to 65 and then 7 in the first decade. The second decade, we slowed down because of a financial system stress, as I showed you. And in the first two, three years of this uh, decade, obviously, we had the pandemic, followed by the commodity price shock. And the reason why the third quarter growth rate is only 4.4% is partly because the growth rate of 1920 
2021, 21, 22 have all been revised higher. The base effect has now become much larger. Naturally, you are comparing 21-22, wherein you have the fourth estimate with 22-23, where you have only the second estimate at this point. So if you are really comparing the sixth estimate and the sixth estimate or the fourth and the fourth, then you will realize that what you are seeing in the data is momentum that is picking up rather than flagging. So I am very confident that when the full number for 22-23 is known in May 2024, because that is when the final uh, more revised estimates will come, it is very likely that you will see that the growth rate will be even higher than the current estimate of 7%. So I don't think there is the uh, uh, danger of India's growth rate stagnating. I, am, I don't want to name, but one of the newspapers correctly took exception to this characterization. Uh, and I think they were right to do so because Mr. Raj Krishna might have come up with this term back in the 60s to indicate a certain mindset that might have been complacent or fatalistic about the growth rate. But even that was not true because it is the same Hindu India which grew at 5% in the 1950s. 60s and 70s, the growth rate stagnated because of specific set of circumstances, partly external and partly policy induced. So I don't think it is necessary to paint with such a wrong and a broad brush. Yes. Sir, uh, sir, good evening, sir. My question is regarding the taxation systems uh, of India. With respect to indirect taxes, we did an uh, important reform through GST and we are reaching almost uh, 1.5 lakhs uh, per month. Uh, with respect to direct taxes, we started off with faceless and uh, vivad se viswas uh, and things, uh, sabka viswas. What will be the uh, that reform which will make the tax to GDP ratio collection with respect to direct taxes higher? Because only one percentage of the Indians are paying the income tax. So yeah. direct taxes should be uh, higher than the indirect tax, so that will be the proportional taxation. Yeah. No, the tax, I understand your question about tax to GDP ratio yeah, and with tax to direct taxes. Huh? With respect to direct taxes rather than the indirect taxes. No, actually, if you look at the data and you have, unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, direct taxes, CBDT, uh, until the pandemic happened, they were producing this uh, time series of uh, tax data from 2000 to 2018, 19, and the last two, three years, they have stopped it. I'm trying to make them revive the time series that they were publishing which is available for public uh, download as well. The truth is, the share of direct taxes is indeed uh, rising and not falling. So the, the ratio between the two is moving in favor of direct taxes. And also if you look at the overall tax to GDP ratio of India, compared to countries at similar stage of development, India's tax ratio is not low. Okay, and the number of people who are now becoming part of the tax system is becoming larger and larger. Even if they don't pay taxes or file nil returns, they are now becoming part of the tax system. So um, India, for example, has kept the minimum tax limit or the, or the tax exempt income at a level that is much higher than the per capita income. Whereas in many other countries, the lowest tax lab starts at a level which is far below their per capita income. So we also have through policy design which was meant to address or compensate our uh, households for higher inflation. We have kept raising the income tax exemption threshold. And we all know that several sectors of the economy are completely exempt from tax as well. So we need to have those conversations. We need to have those debates as we become slightly more uh, prosperous from lower income to lower middle income, etc. But right now, all I would say is for a country at a comparable stage of development, if you look at today's developed countries where they were when they were growing up at this per capita income level, the India's tax to GDP ratio is not low, is even somewhat higher than where they were at a similar stage of development. Okay, the last two questions. We have one here in the front, please. Um, thank you for an excellent, uh, excellent presentation. My question to you is related to debt dynamics. 
and in particular the debt to GDP ratio. And I wanted you to address um, what you think along the trajectory to the $5 trillion economy, what do you expect uh, credit and debt to do? And in particular, could you address um, whether government debt uh, relative to private credit is likely to shrink? Um, do, you, do you have explicit targets and projections for that? And uh, do you believe that there's some crowding out of private credit? And are you guys going to address that? Sure. No, thank you. Uh, Can we just take one more question? Last question, please, ma'am. Uh, where will be India at uh, 100? Where will be India at, currently we are at uh, 75? Where will In be 20, India 47. at 100? Yeah. With an unemployment uh, current rate of uh, 7.6 and uh, with the uh, 600 million population in the age group of uh, 1835 when they reach India at 100. Thank you. Okay, so to address the first question on the debt dynamics, I'll, first of all, we all know very well that when nominal GDP growth exceeds the cost of capital, your debt dynamics is sustainable. And so assuming a reasonable 10% nominal GDP growth on the cost of capital somewhere between 7 and 8%, our debt dynamic is sustainable. That is one. So as long as we uh, make sure the nominal GDP growth is at least 10% per annum, the debt, public debt ratio will be coming down. And that is something I'm confident of simply because the last decade which where we were undergoing a lot of balance sheet repair, even in that decade, in the second half, our nominal GDP growth was 9% per annum on average. So I am confident that it will be at least 10% this decade. The second thing is, if you look at the data from 2005 to 21, India is one of the very few countries, apart from Indonesia and Germany, where the public debt to GDP ratio has barely gone up by two or three percentage points. Many other countries have seen their public debt to GDP ratio expand by about 20 to 30 percentage points. So we actually haven't deteriorated if you, if you take a long, longer view. And the third thing is in the survey, we had a, a box item which shows Suppose the Indian economy had grown in nominal terms at 10% per annum in 1920, which was the fallout of the ILFS and housing finance companies happened pre-pandemic. And then the pandemic year 2021 and 21-22, instead of the current actual profile, the debt and the deficit ratios would be already meaningfully lower than what we have. This counterfactual exercise is meant only to reassure us that if we witness at least three years of studied average 10% GDP growth in nominal terms, we will see a meaningful reduction. Now, the government doesn't have a public debt to GDP target. It only has a gross fiscal deficit target of 4.5% or lower by 25-26. On current trends, we feel comfortable to be able to reiterate the target which we did in the budget as well. And our, looking at the overall debt, public and private put together, India probably is the only country, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong here, but maybe one of the very, very few countries in G20 or even wider set whose overall debt ratio has actually dropped by a few percentage points since 2008. So in other words, we do have the potential to expand the leverage or expand the bank credit to GDP ratio before we start worrying about excess borrowing as in the case with the other developed countries or for that matter China, etc. So in that sense, we still have, the glass is still half, only half full. Yeah. Thank you. And for your last question about where we will be uh, uh, at the centenary, that while in fact we have done a lot of exercises and you can put a number at somewhere between 30 or 32 trillion dollars, etc. at current exchange rates, I can share those numbers with you. But my answer to that will be not to look at numbers and it is not something I'm saying because of philosophical reasons, no. Ultimately, outcomes are not necessarily in our hands, whether it is in individual cases, households or countries. As far as policymakers are concerned, 
we need to focus on making sure that we need to do whatever we do to enhance the productive potential of the economy, the average Indian. Outcomes will take care of themselves. Thank I'm, you. I'm sure we can go on and on, but we have to kill it in somewhere. We'll take it offline. Whoever has any questions. Would you like to take a question, sir? One last one from me. Go ahead. Namaskaram. I am Ramesh. I wanted to ask you, sir, as to what is the impact of the Dravidian model in your central, central policy making? Is there any relevance of the Dravidian model in your work? I think you can take that offline, right? So uh, it, is a, it is my pleasant duty. Yeah, we take it uh, offline, yeah? Thank you. So it's my pleasant duty to thank our chief guest today. It has been an absolutely absorbing evening where we have gone through the plethora of factors which are affecting India's growth story. And he ended on a note that we are well on our way to our target of a $5 trillion economy or even surpassing that. So on that note, I take this opportunity of thanking Dr. Nageshwaran for making it here and more importantly, patiently engaging with all of you uh, and fielding so many questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also would like to thank, CIC would like to thank the college. Murli Dharan, sir, has been very, very helpful in making available all the facilities of the college. And I'm sure all of you would have benefited vastly from such an eminent speaker as Dr. Nageshwaran. And we hope to go out to more and more colleges and we invite all of you, wherever we hold our uh, meetings, our events, all of you are welcome. And please do make uh, use of this opportunity of interacting with the top intellectuals of the country. So with that, yes, please. One small point. Uh, to the students out here, if you have not yet read the economic survey, please do so. <laughs> okay, it is, a, it is a treasure trove of information and also there's plenty of interesting analysis. And the last message for you is that one of the important things that you need to retain as you grow older is intellectual curiosity. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. I now invite Chairman to say a few words. Before anything else, I think I want to definitely show my gratitude to the speaker. It was amazing. And uh, so just on behalf of the institution, A very good evening to all of you. I'm sure, as uh, Dr. Anantha Nagarishwaran was referring to, beyond the first four rows, I think the rest of you would have actually had a different experience today. I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Anantha Nagarishwaran for uh, coming over to our institution. It's a privilege for us to have him here. And special thanks to uh, Chennai International Center uh, uh, Mr. Venugopal, uh, uh, Ms. Chandra Mauli, and uh, dear friend Ramki, who, was, who triggered me into this. So thank you very much. I want to thank all of you on behalf of the Etheraj College. And thanks to all the eminent attendees. There are quite a few. In fact, if I can say so, the first four rows, four rows has uh, prominent entrepreneurs, chartered accountants, analysts, media, I'll tell you the wealth of, uh, obviously, I think like Muhammad Ali, he, while he was handling beautifully, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, he handled all the questions. But I think the wealth of information in the first four rows is something which 
uh, I, I think you, you will all have to emulate what is in the first four rows. Of course, the curriculum across all the colleges is the same. We at Etraj actually, we really believe that one of the aspects that differentiates any student who goes out of these portals is the type of holistic engagement that they have. In that context, exposure such as this is definitely something which is of immense value. And I'm very glad that also many other students from other colleges and other places have come. And I'm sure that knowledge sharing is very, very important. And I'm sure students will leave this auditorium energized by that India story. You're all actually at this point in time when you can see the type of growth that's going to be there. And I'm sure that will make a great impact on all of you. And for the Rudra Dandavam, Sir, the Rutra Tandavam, no worries. It is still available as a movie. It is right there in the YouTube. If the person who needs to can have a look at it and he'll definitely benefit by it. While it's hilarious as a comedy, I'll tell you, it is so holistic. I was just reminded, I have seen in 50 years ago, joint families where there was somebody who was a breadwinner and there was somebody who was contributing differently. If somebody falls ill, there was somebody to take care. I don't think we can make it, commerce is different, economics is different. I think somewhere, I think that message has really come across. Thanks to you for really explaining to all of us. And I'm sure... <laughs> and you had something to say 25 years ago disinvestment of Air India, that took 25 years, but I'm sure that $5 trillion dream will happen much faster. Thank you very much. May God bless. Thank you very much on that note.